Hello, my name is Alan Foom and today I'm going to talk about uh, hydrocarbon water saturation, an important part of the volumetric equation. So there's two charts here. This is uh, some, uh, some uh, logs from a borehole and you can see here that's the interpretation. So the yellow is the sand, the grey is the clay, the red is the hydrocarbon and the blue is the water. So what we're look, going to look today is how do you, people calculate and estimate this particular bit. And this is a saturation height function, free water levels, contacts, areas of water saturation, etc. I'll talk a little bit about that. So why is hydrocarbon saturation important? Well, it's a big part of the volumetric equation. So you have here the uh, volumetric equation, hydrocarbon in place, gross shock volume times net to gross times porosity times the saturation times the formation volume factor. And that gives you the hydrocarbon in place. You multiply that by a recovery factor to get the uh, recoverable volume. Now, I've got videos on porosity, permeability, and uh, recovery factors on my channel, so please check those out. But today we're going to look about uh, saturation. So this is a bit of a Cinderella to some extent because people kind of tend not to talk about it very much. You know, in your volumetric course, you just put, I don't know, 60, 70, 80 percent into the volumetric uh, simulator and then hope for the best. Well, it's a little more complicated than that, so we'll have a brief look at that. First, the most important thing about water saturations and hydrocarbon saturations is you can't measure them directly, unlike porosity, for example, unlike uh, shale fraction. You have to calculate them from secondary sources, mainly resistivity logs because hydrocarbons are resistive and water is conductive. Um, and the various equations to do that, I'll talk a little bit about those. Also, nuclear magnetic resonance logs, which are distinguished mobile from mobile water. That's actually quite important, but they're relatively new and they're also quite expensive. Uh, to run. Also thermal decay neutron logs, which is what you would do in a cased hole, because resistivity uh, tools generally tend not to work in an open hole. Uh, only tend to work in open hole, not in case hole way behind uh, steel casing. And water saturations directly related to porosity uh, generally tend to be uh, low porosity rocks tend to have higher water saturations. So here's a picture of some logs and here's a picture of some pores. Dark blue is the water and the red is the hydrocarbons. So saturation transition zone. So several concepts here. The water saturation is percentage of volume which is occupied by water, percentage of pore volume which is occupied by water. Irreducible water saturation is this line here. So there'll always be some water which just won't move. That's called irreducible water saturation. Transition zone is this bit here. So when you're above the transition zone, you should be at a reducible water saturation. The rest of it should be hydrocarbon, uh, which is mobile. Here in the transition zone, uh, you tend to have both mobile hydrocarbons and mobile water. So the SW tends to go up till it reaches one at the well water contact. The free water level is when the capillary pressures, the entry pressures for both oil and water are identical. So this is where everything comes from. So this is a diagram from a bloke called Steve Cuddy. He's a petrophysicist, publishes quite a lot on LinkedIn. So please follow him if you want more details. But here you have a, a pressure versus depth graph. So these are depths below data, in this case sea level, and this is uh, pressures uh, measured by a tool like an MTT tool, an RFT tool. So at free water level, the water gradient intersects the, um, the hydrocarbon gradient. So you have the hydrocarbon gradient here, so these are oil-related pressures. Then you have water-related pressures, and you have different free water levels for different uh, units. And so depth of water saturation is less than one. And all, uh, above that, oil becomes mobile. And this is used as a base for saturation height functions. Another picture from Steve Cuddy, which is, again is quite important. Uh, you've got, this is what typical rock volume would be made of. So you've got matrix, for example, quartz grains or limestone grains. You've got silt, you've got clay. So this is V shale. You've got clay bound water. So some clay minerals attract water, which is related, which is retained within the clay. Then you have a capillary bound water and hydrocarbon, and this is what you actually want to know, the hydrocarbon saturation. But the resistivity log reads both capillary bound water and clay bound water, which tends to be a bit of a problem, particularly in shaley sands, where you've got quite a lot of this uh, clay uh, material in, in, the, in the rock. So you would tend to overestimate um, hydrocarbon saturation potentially using traditional methods. So resistivity logs are um, logs where you pass electric currents. So shallow and deep, they have different depths of investigation, anything from one to two meters. And you have uh, really, uh, you have the extreme shallow logs that uh, give you the invader zone. I'll come to that in a minute. 
And when you have separation, then the fluids have different properties, drilling and the formation is permeable. So electric logs were invented in the 1920s, 1930s, and have been run ever since. They've been quite significantly refined. You can get them both in uh, LWD, logging while drilling, or wireline uh, tools. Um, and you have different tools for different uh, different uh, MUD systems. So for example, an oil-based MUD, you would tend to use uh, induction logs because normal res uh, as conventional resistivity logs don't work, whereas you'll use as conventional resistivity logs and water base. So this is the different things that would measure. So you've got the invaded zone, which is where the uh, fluids in the uh, in the rock have been moved by the drilling mud. Then you have the uh, transition zone. We have uh, some fluid being moved. Then you have the uninvaded zone. So you have different tools that will read resistivities within the different layers. These are roughly the distances for these layers, diameters relative to the borehole. And you can use that to calculate how mobile potentially the um, the fluids are. Generally, the resistivity logs then have a depth of investigation of up to two meters, but a resolution of about 80 centimeters. It becomes a problem if you've got thin beds. So here's the log interpretation. So you have the gamma ray log here, which is a shale indicator. So this is where the sand is. Then you have the neutral density cross plot. So this is a gas. We have big separation between neutral and density. You have narrow separation oil, and then pretty much on top of each other for brines, uh, for brine or, or water. So highly conductive brine, low conductivity hydrocarbons. So this is where the resistivity log, if you've got a kick like that in a resistivity log, providing you have sand, you might well have hydrocarbons. Obviously you'll have other indicators to support that. Thermal neutral logs are run in cased hole because um, Conventional uh, electrical resistivity tools don't work behind a steel pipe. So what you would tend to do is you tend to use that to monitor hydrocarbon saturation movement during the time. When you are working in an oil field, which is being produced by water drive, you would tend to have a, diff uh, a different uh, SW to what you started with. Basically, SW would increase as water displaces oil. You need to monitor what's going on for your reservoir model to understand what's happening. So you would run one of these thermal decay neutron tools, and this will give you an idea of uh, what has happened to saturation since you started production. Obviously, you need to have access to the well, so you can't do this in subsea wells. If you have wells on a platform, wells on land, you can access it for data gathering. That's a useful thing to be able to do. Arch equations So how you calculate saturation. So saturation equals the A exponent times the resistivity of the formation water, brosity times the M exponent, sedimentation factor, uh, multiplied by the um, resistivity of the formation, the true resistivity of the formation from the deep resistivity log. Uh, you'd generally tend to get the brosties from the uh, cross plots, uh, row B and Pfizer traditionally, you can obviously get it from Sonic, there are various other tools to measure porosity. You get your formation resistivity from the resistivity tools, and you get the water's resistivity from the water sample, and you estimate the exponents. And this is how traditionally saturations have been calculated since the 1940s. But this tool does have limitations, limitations in shaley sands, limitations if you've got pyrite, um, hydrogen sulfide, um, not hydrogen sulfide, iron sulfide in, uh, in the rock, complex pore geometries, thin beds where the resistivity can't uh, um, differentiate, or low salinity formation waters if you've got fresh waters. Apart from that, it works really well, but obviously you need to know what's going on to be able to use that. If you're in shaley sands, and this is a diagram from Steve Cuddy's blog, where you try to basically see what equations you would do. And there are various different equations, the Denisia, Simandu, Waxman, Smiths, etc., that you would try to get both total saturation and effective saturation. And you would try to do that to understand where the clay bound water in the matrix affects resistivity. Try to get a truer picture of the saturation rather than uh, over reading due to clay bound water. And this is another picture talking about the Shaley Sands problem. Again, uh, this is paper Doveton, uh, posted by Sai Jaffrey on LinkedIn. Uh, Steve Cuddy has done this diagram. So you've got a situation where the sky blue line here, that's your Archie calculation. Then you have different saturation uh, calculations using Waxman Smith and some of the different types of equation. So again, you need to make sure that you use the right equation for the right rock. And your friendly petrophysicist will be able to do that so you can have a nice conversation with them. They're really quite nice people. They don't bite. Capillary pressure curves. So capillary pressure is basically the entry pressure, differential pressure between uh, the fluids. And you have basically in better quality rock, you would tend to have lower saturations because of lower capillary pressure. And these are different 
Rock's Instance Diagram from Steve using different permeabilities. And I have a video on permeability which explains that. In terms of um, larger pore throats tend to have lower saturations. So again, uh, you want to have bigger pore throats, so bigger actual crystals, bigger uh, grains, which give you larger pore throats, even though smaller grains may give you the same bread porosity. So if you've got 20% porosity units, you tend to have uh, higher saturations uh, for, the, for hydrocarbons, you tend to have lower porosity units, you have higher SW, lower hydrocarbon saturation. Saturation height function. So this is where you um, try to figure out what's going on. Now you have a saturation height function. This is a lever at J function, quite a complicated looking formula. But basically you have uh, hydrocarbon saturation would uh, increase with uh, with height from the free water level due to due to buoyancy. It's formula for estimating saturations, and this is what you would plug into a geocellular model. Now the key point here is that uh, different rock types, as we saw before, different grain sizes, different porosity uh, distributions, etc., they would tend to have each a separate saturation function, and you would plug that into your model. And Trying to get it right in the reservoir model is actually quite uh, difficult. This is a post by a guy called Dan O'Meara looking at the consequences of using saturation height functions. He's not a particular fan. But the key point here is that the functions should honor the results that you get from measurements. And realization is actually of this saturation is actually quite a key uncertainty in reservoir modeling because you can't measure it directly. And obviously in dynamic simulations, hydrocarbon uh, saturation changes as oil is swept away, it's displaced by water, and you need a history match and try to figure out what's going on. And you can get data through the coastal field life, new infill wells, it'll give you conventional resistivity tools, or using thermal decay neutron uh, tool logs for routine data gathering if that is possible. So key points. Uh, saturation is part of the volumetric equation, key part of the volumetric equation, but a bit forgotten one. You tend to average it for each layer in basic volumetrics. You just plug in a number and meh. Well, it's kind of a little more complicated than that in reality because in static models you tend to use hydrocarbon, uh, satur you tend to use saturation height functions for each different rock type. And in dynamic models, saturation changes of production. This can be history match, data measurement through data measurements such as TDT logs, new infill wells, etc. But the key point, absolute key point, is saturation is not measured by borehole logs directly, calculated from other measurements. So there's quite a lot of ambiguity here. So related to porosity and permeability, with lower porosity rocks that have higher saturations. Now, if you want to know more, please follow Steve Cuddy on LinkedIn. Publishes quite a lot of useful stuff. Also the APG Wiki, SB Petro Wiki. So please like, please subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one.